Thanks for joining us today on Apostolic Pentecostal Channel. We are here to provide new and classic sermons weekly. We have tried to remaster and restore these sermons. Thanks for joining us. Please like, comment, and subscribe. May Yahweh's blessings be with you. I bring you greetings from Washington, D.C. If you wonder how we're doing, well, I don't know about everything in D.C., but the church there is doing well. <laughs> the people of God are doing all right. And um, my wife and I are thrilled to be here with you. I think probably what we should do, first of all, I can't say thank you enough to your pastor, his wife, their um, hospitality and kindness to us, and certainly giving me this opportunity uh, in his pulpit today. I don't take that lightly. And um, again, we're honored to be with you. I think we'll start with reading our scripture, all right? And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best, all right? I want to follow the leading of the Spirit. I have notes. That means nothing. Okay. All right. I will do my best. I, I, uh, I don't think that... Uh, I don't think that that God is taken by surprise by our being here today. I think he has a destiny for each and every one of our lives. And uh, I think the key to that for your destiny, for my destiny, the destiny of the church is to pursue with all of our hearts Jesus, Amen. to follow Jesus. We, we may not understand, as a matter of fact, I think probably we won't understand everything that happens in life. But if we keep our focus on Jesus and don't let the things that are happening in our world take away our focus, we'll be all right if we just pursue Jesus with all of our hearts. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you, if you will give yourself completely now, when I say that, I understand that that is a process of the work of God. That we, we say we're, we're human and we say, I want to give my all. But that's not necessarily, you know, it's a struggle. It's a challenge. It's many, many times at the altar. It's much prayer. It's understanding the word and being taught the word and submitting ourselves to God and surrendering our will to him. But if we will pursue him with all of our hearts, he will reveal his destiny for you, for your life to you. You, you won't get it out of a, a crystal ball. You won't get it out of a Cracker Jack box. You, you won't necessarily... Hear it from, hello, a prophet. Yeah. All right. But if you will follow close to Jesus, he will reveal his destiny, his destiny for your life. And uh, that's why we're here today. Maybe another, so to speak, piece of the puzzle. Maybe another word from God. Not, not just the title of a message, but somewhere in the preaching, an anointed word can speak into your heart and revive faith and hope and desire that the flame may have gone out. But God is able to reignite the flame within your heart to pursue, to seek after God with all of our hearts. And listen, that it's now been 47 years in my life that Jesus came and changed my life. But I promise you, it, it never, it, it cannot go out. It's just as important today as it was 47 years ago when I first began on the journey. And none of us have it all together. You, you know that, right? All right. No. Okay. Well, I'm hoping that's right because I know I sure have my own. All right. If, um, if you have your Bibles and want to turn to the book of Joshua with me, I'm going to read 
one verse from the third chapter of Joshua. And then I'm going to talk to us a little bit. And then I got some other scripture I'm going to read. And I'm going to talk to us some more. Maybe. Everybody's got a smile. All right. And um, it's it really is very exciting to be here, to feel the presence of God. You know, that's really what it's all about. It doesn't matter whether you're in D.C. or in Portland, to feel the presence of God, to be in the secret place of the Most High is uh, an amazing thing. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And I'm going to endeavor, I hope to bring us, I know that I'm, I'm not, I was asked this earlier, and I'm not sure where we'll end up. You know? I mean, I have a, a desire for us all to end up in the presence of God, surrendering our will to His will, putting our all on the altar of sacrifice, and saying, whatever you ask of me, God, I'm willing to do. That's, that's a desire, not only of my heart, but it's the heart of God. If we will surrender our will to His will, all things become possible. They don't become possible. They are possible because He is God, but they don't become possible in your life until you surrender your will to His will. So, I want to speak on the difference one decision can make. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. You know, this is quite... Uh, I, the pastor said that our church is like this, and I guess it probably is in some respects that we have multiple ethnic groups and people from all over the world. But you know, this is a little closer. Right now we meet in an auditorium of a Catholic uh, high school, and um, it seats about 500. We don't fill it up quite yet. But, uh, but there is... a. Uh, Feeling of his, and it's not just based on feeling, you know. There's a knowledge of God, and there is a will and a word of God. But it sure is nice to feel him. Amen. It really is nice to kind of have the touch of his hand and feel his presence and feel that we're in a divine direction. And, uh, and from my understanding of Scripture, there are moments that are more significant than others. Hello? All right, just, just nod your head or smile, yell a little bit. It's okay with me. All right, but uh, um, I'm going to start with a story. And I'm in the beginning, and, and maybe all the way through, I will stay close to my notes because I felt in my heart and I wrote it down, and, or in this case, typed it out. But uh, I hope to be able to open our understanding, our minds. We are living in a very significant moment. And it's not the first time in the history of man in 6,000 years there have been other significant moments. But we all can kind of sense there's something about the moment we are living in. It's, you know, I, I used the, this recently, you know, Brother Dickens, you know, Charles, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll quote a little bit from Brother Charles. He said, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. I don't know, haven't you felt some of that in your life? I mean, it's all around us. In some ways, the world seems to be stable, but boy, in other ways, all around us, it's instability. Things changing so rapidly, you know, and I'm, I'm not quite as young as I once was. That's what Brother David said. I was once young, but now I'm more mature. <laughs> Isn't that what he said? Something like that. But I think he said old 
That was so hard to say that word. But in my lifetime, just in my lifetime, the changes that have happened, the deep changes that, and it's, they happened in moments and times where we really were not aware of changes that were taking place. But they took, they were significant decisions that were made that still today or have that ripple effect and affect your life, whether you know it or not, and my life, our children's lives. Now, my wife and I, we have four children, 16 grandchildren and four great-grandchildren, a fifth one on the way. We, <laughs> we, read, we read in the Bible we're supposed to go forth and replenish the earth, and so we've been at work at it. And yet there are times, surely you would agree with me, there are times where I can have some, uh, I hate to use the word fear, but uh, anxieties about the future, not for myself, my grandchildren. What kind of world will they enter? My great-grandchildren, Lord Jesus, will the world even still be here? Sur surely we all share some of those thoughts about the time that we are living in. But I'm going to tell you, in the midst of it, God has always had an answer. Always, always had an answer. God has not gone into panic attack. He, he knows the end from the beginning. He has issued a, a, a universal call. Whosoever will to the Lord may come. It's, it's not limited to one uh, culture of people. My, we are living in an amazing hour from that perspective. Even from the work in D.C., we now have folks that have gone to the Republic of Georgia. And uh, our son and his wife went first. And then my um, great nephew went and because my son and his wife had a baby that was born with a brain disease and they had to come back home. But, you know, uh, it, God knows what he's doing. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I say that because even in the midst of your trial, God is at work. Yeah. You, his ways are higher than our ways. Yeah. And uh, actually, when my son and his wife came home, they... Uh, through some events, uh, went to a church in Iowa that had the, the leadership had gotten very old and the numbers of the church had gone way down. In a sense, uh, it was kind of dead. Hello? But they went to that church because his wife had gotten saved at that church as a teenager. And when they walked in, the pastor said, I've been waiting on you to get here. I'm going to turn this church to you. And they have been there now three years. And they're running about 100, 120. And it, it's been raised, so to speak, out of the ruins. Life, new life, people coming in that have all kind of problems. Because how many of you know that's kind of the world we live in? I don't know. Do, if you know anybody that don't have a problem, please introduce me. I, I, don't, I don't meet people that don't have problems. But God has always had an answer for uh, the dilemma of our world. His answer is the church. You're it. You're, you're God's answer for the world. Uh, hello? Now. That's really, I'm not lying to you. I'm telling you the truth. You may be thinking like, I barely survived yesterday. How in the world could I be the answer for the dilemma of our world? Because God chose you. You, he, you love him because he first loved you. You don't even have the capacity on your own to love him. When Folks, most, I, I can't say all, but most folks, when they come to the Lord today, the enemy has done his very best to kill them. Kill desire, kill love, 
kill the ability to, you know, he wants to destroy your ability to have faith. He wants to cause you to always question the very fact whether there is a God or not. He wants to put your mind in such a quandary that you don't feel like you could ever accomplish anything. But God says, if you'll come to me and give me just whatever it is you have left, you may be barely breathing, but if you'll give it to God, God will do amazing things with your life. And so we are called from all kinds of backgrounds. Uh, That that church in Georgia, when they went there, um, I don't know, a number of years ago, there there was not an apostolic church in the entire nation. Oh, how that nation had suffered. You know, that's where Stalin was from, from Tbilisi. He... uh, Maybe to some he was a hero, but to most of the folks, he committed great genocide and and did not care for his people. And now God is raising up not one church, but I know my son would talk to me about his desire. Such cities as Batumi, I have no idea. Kuda Isi, I am not talking with tongues. They (laughs) Cities along the Black Sea. With people who had, you know, maybe for centuries, that is hard for us to comprehend. But for centuries, there was a vacuum, a vacancy of God. And so God chooses a young man and sends him into that vacuum with faith. And the presence of God begins to flow through one vessel. And now hundreds are being baptized in the name of Jesus and receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. See, sometimes we think it has to be, uh, you know, the masses. But God is really saying, just give me one. Just give me one. A woman at a well, a man in a sycamore tree, a blind man on the wayside. Just a one. And another couple, um, they actually, this girl, first she went to uh, Latvia. And um, she married, ended up marrying a guy from uh, Uzbekistan who became an apostolic pastor, and now they have home churches in Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Hello, just stand everywhere. (laughs) And small groups meeting of people so hungry from, listen, he said in the last days, saith God, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. This, this is our hour. This is our moment. We are you and I. It must become personal. Decisions are not just made collectively. This church will not make a decision, in a sense, for your life. We will do our best to persuade you. Jesus Christ has come, and he even has angels in this room breathing into your heart about the decisions you will make because one decision can make the difference. Just one decision. Okay, I'm going to go back to my notes. This is a story taken from a book written by Mark Batterson. I'm not promoting. i just telling you where I got the source. It's entitled, It's Time to Pack Your Coffin. Yeah, there's an interesting story. <laughs> a century ago, A band of brave souls became known as one-way missionaries. 
They purchased single tickets to the mission field without the return half. And instead of suitcases, they packed their few earthly belongings into coffins. A.W. Milne was one of those missionaries. He set sail for the New Hebrides in the South Pacific, knowing full well that the headhunters who lived there had martyred every missionary before him. Milne did not fear for his life because he had already died to himself. One decision, one decision. He came to an altar and decided, not my will, but thy will be done. No matter the price, I'm going to bring myself to this altar. You see, we don't know who sits among us today who could be the next one to infect an entire nation. Now, I've lived long enough. I've pastored long enough. That little boy that is over there in Georgia today who literally now has spoken to masses of people who have come and been filled with the Spirit. I remember when that little boy was three years old and come up on the platform and sing with me blessed assurance. And his life was not necessarily easy because the enemy kind of knows when you have the mark of God on you. And some of you have wondered why your life has been so hard. And you've wondered why the trials. Because there is a very real enemy who wants to destroy your faith, your hope, your passion. Because the enemy seems to detect when there is a hand of God on somebody. And we don't know who is sitting here today who maybe today you will make a decision that will affect not only your family, but your family's family and your family's family's family and your neighbors and you never know your city. And you never know when I mean, I could tell you stories. They're history. They're not my stories. They're stories you can look up for yourself. Yvonne Roberts was a young man in the country of Wales. Who really, as a teenager, in a time when religion was, hello, not really alive. But he, as a young teenage young man, received a burden to pray. Just to pray. Well, there's a novel idea. To pray, just to pray. And he made a decision and he went to the pastor because he was not allowed to pray in the church. Wow. But he went to the pastor and the pastor gave him permission on a Wednesday night to come and pray or whatever the midweek was to come and pray. And first he went by himself and he prayed. Prayed with such intensity. You might call it Gethsemane style praying where he prayed with such intensity. And the next week, more people came. More people came. Until the pastor actually kind of heard about the prayer and came until literally, listen, I'm I'm going kind of to the conclusion of the story, but the entire nation of Wales was affected. People were in the streets on their knees praying to God, all because the decision of one young man to pray. It is said that every drinking, alcohol drinking establishment in the country of Wales was closed down because... Of the prayers of one, one man. Oh, what God can do with one, with one who will make the decision that I am giving my all. I give my life to Jesus Christ and to come to an altar and surrender your will to his will. Can ignite a fire of passion and revival like The likes of which our world has never seen. Milne packed his coffin. For 35 years he lived among that tribe and loved them. When he died, the tribal members buried him in the middle of their village and inscribed this epitaph on his tombstone. When he came... 
there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. One man. One man. One decision. The difference one decision can make. So in a way, though I speak to everyone that's here, there may be the one that the Spirit is searching for. Maybe you didn't sleep well last night. Maybe it's been a week long of the Holy Spirit working on your heart to bring you to this moment where you will make a decision that may affect your world. You see, Jesus did not die to keep us safe. (laughs) He died to make us dangerous. Hello? Yo! Look out, devil! Here we come. The least, you might say, in the kingdom of God. One who have may just entered the kingdom recently is an incredible threat to hell and all its captives. One who barely knows, not a great theologian, one who has just been delivered from the darkness of the kingdom of darkness, right? Oh, is a threat to hell. The gates begin to rattle. Hello? Murmurs through hell. Oh, my Lord, here comes one of those. When you praise, your prayer may be a weak prayer. Your praise may be just a breath. You understand sometimes we think it's the louder. And don't get me wrong, I'm all for loud. But sometimes it's not loud. Sometimes it's like the breath or the, the prayer of the weak little grandmother who's just been praying, 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 praying. But I promise you there's a God in heaven who's been listening to the faintest prayer of a child of God. And he will answer. He will move. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. Hello? It's storming the gates of hell. The will of God is not an insurance plan. It's a daring plan. (laughs) He's seeking into the hearts right now of people. And saying, come on. You know what I mean? Sometimes we can get locked in. I go to church. I go every Sunday. And sometimes I'm telling you that don't frighten hell. Hello, but when church gets inside of you. <laughs> when the Spirit of God gets inside of you. And the promise of God and the Jesus gets inside of you and begins to move inside of you. It frightens hell. Addicts can be set free. Broken lives can be healed. All because of Jesus living in you. The complete surrender of your life to the cause of Christ should not be radical. It should be normal. It's what we do. We just come and throw ourselves on the altar. I can't figure it out. I can't understand it all. I can't fix everything. But I know the one who can. He saves to the uttermost. And he saves to the guttermost. Huh? Hello? I'm sure I'm not the only one that was in the gutter when Jesus found me. I had nothing to offer him but a broken life. But he said, I'll take your broken life. I'll take whatever you'll give me. Sometimes even as pastors or even as church members, faithful people of God, it's hard for us to look at someone in the condition they're in 
and have the vision that Jesus has. <laughs> oh, because no, we can't do what Jesus can do. Jesus looks at you and sees your potential when all you see is failure. Jesus looks at the introvert and says, man, I'm going to have a great time making an extrovert out of this one. <laughs> you see, the time to quit living, it's time to quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. Hello? Well, I'll just hold on till I die. Come on, give me a break. There's nothing exciting about that. We ought to make the devil pay. Did he ever give you any trouble? Has he ever made your life hurt and ache? Your praise makes the devil wish he'd have killed you while he had the opportunity. You ought to praise him louder. You ought to praise him longer. You ought to praise when you don't feel like it. Yes, yes, yes. Look, theology, I know who Jesus is. I know he's God. But I'll be honest with you. All those other tough questions, I may not have all the answers to, but don't you worry, I got a good friend who has all the answers. <laughs> but what I do know, I was lost. I was blind. I was a mess. I was a prisoner. And Jesus came. What I know for sure, I'm not what I used to be. And what is it that will make a difference in our world? It's not you being able to give them all the theological answers. Nothing wrong with that. You, you need to learn. But, but I'm telling you, that's not what gets the attention of the world. It's when they watch, what happened to you? What happened to you? you you're not the same person. You're, you better believe I'm not. What happened? Jesus came in. Jesus came into my life. Jesus made the difference in my life. You see, the truth is, it's time. Whether you like it or not. 2020, you've come to the church. Hello? And the church is not just this building and it's not just an organization. The church is the body of Christ. It's the family of God. It's us. Whether you like it or not, I'm related to you. Hello? <laughs> hello? <laughs> like it or not, I'm your brother. scary huh have you ever had family members you hope nobody knew was related to you <laughs> I know what I'm talking about my family Lord we won't even go there but today was it February 16th 2020 it's us from every culture, all kinds of backgrounds, winners, losers, and others. We've been called by God. He brought us here, and we are it. You have been chosen by God. Now, I'm going to tell you how it works. It doesn't really work until you embrace it. You can deny you're my brother. Tough, I'm going to tell them anyway. <laughs> you can deny that you're in my family, but I'm going to tell them anyway. Yeah. Because we've been chosen. 
We've been chosen like it's taken from the book of Esther for such a time as this. This is our moment. This is it. Most of us, if you're like me, we're not even sure what to do. Just, yeah, bah, bah, bah. <laughs> That's it. He got it. See? <laughs> but what do I know about Jesus? What I know about Jesus is he is well able. He is well able. He's never lost control. He, 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 he's never wondered what's going to happen. He's got it together. Did you know he knew us before we knew him? And you may not even like this, but those things that happened in your life, he knew. He's, I'm going to mold you. You're going to experience. Why? Why? Because the only way the, you can relate to the world, or maybe the world relate to you, you've got to have compassion. You've got to have love. You got to have a heart. And that heart is molded by God. It's in the scripture. The heart of the king is molded by God. It's us. Here we are. It wasn't no accident what you went through. God didn't design it, but he uses it. He didn't plan for you to be hurt so bad and wounded so bad. And sometimes it happens in church. I know not this church. Hell, hell. But, but I'm telling you, we have to come to a place today where we make a decision that we accept. This is it. I'm it. Now, I'm not hearing the excitement I was hoping for. This is, we're it. He chose us. Others may wonder. Listen, when I came to Jesus, when Jesus came to me, because I'll be honest with you, he came to me before I could come to him. But when he came to me, my life had problems with drugs and alcohol, a filthy mouth, a filthy mind. Yeah. Evil, evil. Yeah. I had even family members who thought for sure my life could never amount to anything. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you about Jesus. I'm not telling you about my earthly father or my earthly mother. Or my brothers and my sisters according to the flesh. I'm talking about the family of faith. The people of God. And I'm telling you, God is bigger than your failures. And he chose us. He chose us for this hour. He chose us. I, you see, it's time. I got this in bold print in my notes, so I think it's important to say. It's time for amazing things to happen. It's time for amazing things to happen. You know, I know time-wise, you know, I'm feeling what I feel. And yet, I could keep you here all day. Just trying to convince you, sir, it's not over. You may feel like it's over. Statistic may say it's over. People around you may say it's over. But if you listen to the voice of God today, he's telling you it's not over. I got a plan. I got a purpose. I got a destiny for you. It's not to be a loser. It's to be a winner. Yes, yes. Now I'm going to tell you something. I know you can go to rah rah meetings. Hello? You know what I mean? Like pep rallies. Everybody say hallelujah. No, that's not what I'm doing. I'm not here with a rah rah session. All it takes is one moment of an anointing of God to speak something, to take one word and anoint it and speak it into your heart and you will never be the same. You may have been depressed, but you can walk out of here with victory in your heart. You can walk out of here obsessed 
with Jesus Christ. I'm just going to, I'm not going to read it for the sake of time, but in the 14th chapter of Joshua is a story about a man. He is actually one of two men that survived 40 years of wilderness, 40 years of unbelievers, complainers and moaners and groaners. Hello, you ever, hello, some of you lived in families like that. Right? Yes, yes. Oh, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the faith, that quality, that intangible quality in Caleb's heart. Forty years he had to walk around with those bunch of, hallelujah. Right? And then 40 years... The last one of them died. And they came out of the wilderness. And they walked across the Jordan River. And they faced Jericho. But Caleb, he had been given a promise. Like, Lord, how many of you ever just been living off of a promise? You know what I mean? I mean, I'm not talking about one week. I'm not even talking about a year. I'm talking about 40 plus years. Caleb said, Moses told me I can have that mountain. And the people around said, don't you know that mountain's filled with giants? Anybody got any giants in your life? Anybody anybody got any problem with finances? Anybody got any problem with health? Anybody got any problem? You know what I'm saying? Giants that are telling you, you cannot have that promise. You cannot have that mountain. But God had, through Moses, had given Caleb the promise. And now it's 40 plus years later. And he goes to Joshua in the 14th chapter of the book of Joshua. And he says just like Moses said. I'm coming to you. He's 85 years old. Gives me a little hope. Yeah. That's it. Me too. <laughs> he said I want my mountain. Somebody said man it's filled with giants. He said I don't care about no giants. Your faith has got to be larger than your giants. Your faith has got to remember what God promised you. Listen, I often tell the story of my mother and father. My father didn't go to church. My mother was an apostolic lady. My father had a girlfriend. And in the 50s, My father said to my mother, I want a divorce. And my mother said, no, you don't get one. You got five kids. I'll give you a room in the back of the house. Yes. Well, it even gets bigger. I look back on it now and I'm amazed. Because dad worked. Like 12 hours a day. I don't even know how I had time for another woman. But (laughs) he worked 12 hours a day. Six days a week. That's it. They make a way, don't they? (laughs) But I'm telling you. (sighs) For like. I don't know, 14, 15, 18 years, whatever it was. Every morning, my mother would fix my father breakfast at 5.30 in the morning before he went to work. She'd wash his clothes. But I would hear her probably about 5 o'clock out there praying. That was about the time, just about the time dad came home from after spending the night with his girlfriend. And she'd be praying. 
fix him breakfast. He'd go off to work about 6 o'clock that night. Mom had the rules. She was a little tiny little lady, but she run the house. <laughs> she laid down the rules, said, you be home at 6 o'clock, Joe. That was dad. And she'd fix dinner, and we all had to sit around the table so much tension because, you know, mom said, now you got to pray before you eat. So somebody would pray, and we'd eat in silence. And then dad would get up, go get cleaned up, and go spend the night with his girlfriend. I'm not talking about a week. I, would, I got so angry as a teenager, I had a lot of repenting due to my mother and to God because I would curse. I would tell my mother, and I wasn't the only one. Other people said, you need to divorce him. You need to get rid of that scoundrel. Oh, they had other words. We don't say those words. And my mother would say, oh, no, Joe's going to live for Jesus. I went to Vietnam. Six months before I come home from Vietnam, I was sitting in a bar. I'd been there for a week. And Jesus walked in. Now, you can believe what you want. Jesus walked over and tapped me on the shoulder. I looked, oh, Jesus, what are you doing in here, man? <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> But he spoke to me. He said, it's your time. Jesus is saying to somebody today, come on. When are you going to? No, this is your time. Today is the day of decision. Just make it. So I got up and ran back to the base. My job was building bombs. I locked myself in the magazine area with the bombs. And I got on my knees and I prayed. I prayed. I probably learned really mostly how to pray from hearing my mother pray. And I prayed. I didn't know there was one of those shortcuts you could take. Give me, forgive me of all my sins. I thought I, I thought I had to repent of every one of them. So the Holy Spirit began to bring back to my memory all those sins. Even the sins of my childhood. Evil things. Bad things. But somewhere in the middle of that night... Nobody around, just me and Jesus. He baptized me with the Holy Ghost. He filled me with the Spirit. He changed my life. And of course, I am the direct recipient of that. But let me tell you, that wasn't all the story. On that exact same day on the other side of the world, my father came home from work and said to my mother, do you have church tonight? He went to church with my mother, received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, gave up his girlfriend, gave up his old life. How does that happen? Just one more prayer. Not giving up, hanging on, believing God. Just one more decision to keep going on. You know, I could tell you all the things that happened be in that life that when I was a child because it wasn't good, it was pre wasn't pretty, it was ugly, and all the things that mom had to do and the rest of the family had to do because dad really wasn't there. But boy, one night, you hear me, one night, one night, there was something different in the air. There was something different in the kingdom of God. I had my own imagination. I think God heard my mother pray one more time. He said, you know, I'm tired of this business. He sent angels down there to where I was. Come on, it's time for you. And he went to where my father was at work. My father was a hardworking man. I mean, in many ways, he was good. He paid the bills. But he stopped to where my father was that day and said, Joe, it's your time. I became my father and mother's pastor. They became like newlyweds. People that, people that 
didn't know this story wouldn't have believed that my dad and mom had been through all those years of such a dark trial and such a hard thing that happened in our family. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to tell you, there's nothing impossible with God. Just This is our time. Just like it was Caleb's time. Caleb looked up at that mountain. All the evidence was stacked against him and said, you can't have that mountain. Voices said, you can't have that mountain. But Caleb said, I got a promise. This is my mountain. Give me my mountain. I may be 85, but this is my mountain. Those giants may be big, but this is my mountain. And somebody here today, I'm not here to criticize anyone because I believe you're on a journey. Maybe you've been coming to church for a long time or maybe just a couple of weeks or maybe this is your first time. But somewhere in it, the Spirit of God is working inside of you. And he's telling you, this is your time. All you got to do is make one decision. Everything else, he can take care of. He can heal your body. He can heal your family. He can supply whatever your need is. But you got to make, first you got to make a decision. I looked in, you know, this isn't, in some ways, it's a very dark time. You know that. I'm not telling you something you don't know, right? In some ways... Like when we went to D.C., there's over 6 million people. And I remember walking down the street thinking, Lord, how in the world do I reach 6 million people? Hello, if he gives you an answer, please come and tell me. All I can tell you is the answer he gave me that came to my heart was one, one at a time, one at a time. And he began to do miracles and open doors. And we baptized people. We had all kinds of people come. I tell the story, but it's my wife is my witness. We did street services and I really didn't. I got equipment, but I didn't play anything. And I would set it up and say to people as it was walking by, you want to play something? Just make some noise. It'll draw a crowd. And then I would talk to people about Jesus. Well, one Saturday, see, because there are key people. I said this earlier, and I don't, God didn't necessarily give me a word, but I felt it earlier. There may be someone sitting here right here. You have no idea what God plans to do through your life. Even if we tried to explain it, it would probably be so much smaller than what God does. God creates worlds. Hello? (laughs) God puts stars out. You ever looked up there and tried to count the stars? God put them all out there. Right? He is so big. So even if you tried to think of it, it would be limited. You understand that? But maybe today, today, a young man, a young lady, an old man, a more mature lady. You don't say old. (laughs) That grandmother, that mother, that father, that grandfather today waited so long. And I'm here, my life don't look like much. It's all I got. And Jesus says, if, if you just come and give it to me, I can give you a mountain. I can kill giants. I can give you blessings. I can turn your world upside down. And on this Saturday morning, this guy walked by. He had a couple of friends with him. He was a Spanish fella. 
I knew no Spanish, very little. I knew Dios e bendiga. I said that to them all when they passed by. Dios e bendiga. Dios e bendiga. God bless you. God bless you. Then they would start talking. I said, yes, I don't know what you said. But this guy, he stopped and he said to me, could I get a picture with you? I said, sure, that'd be fine. So he got there and they got a picture and they went on their way. The next morning before service, we met in this building of a, a basement of an old Baptist church where we kill the rats before the people come. Rats kind of affect your worship. Yeah. Right? Oh. <laughs> Hello? But so we would get there early and I was there early. And here came that guy down the stairs. And he had a couple of friends with him, the same guys that were with him the day before. And he said to me, Pastor, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He said, Friday night, my sister called me from Mexico City. She said, Juan, you got to go give your life to Jesus Christ. He is coming soon. He said, I said, yeah, yeah. Si, si. <laughs> The next day, he saw me. He said, oh, I get a picture with the preacher. I send it to my sister. She'll leave me alone. <laughs> but he said, Pastor, after I saw you, which would have been on Saturday morning, he said, Saturday night, the drug cartel murdered my sister he said so I am here today to keep my promise to my sister and he fell on his face and began to repent of his sins and God baptized him with the Holy Ghost I didn't know he was the padrino for the Mexican mafia I didn't know that those men with him they weren't his friends they worked with him I didn't know he was a pimp, a drug dealer. But Jesus brought him. In the next year, that man, Juan, brought over 50 people to Jesus Christ. <laughs> See, look, you say, oh, it's not possible. Oh, no, no, it's not only possible. God knows what he's doing. In the middle of the night, Juan would call me, Pastor, you got to come with me. We're going to go have Bible study. <laughs> he would take me to places, heroin addicts, prostitutes. Sit down, Pastor, going to teach you Bible study. <laughs> he would bring people to get baptized. Get in the tank, Pastor, going to baptize you. It was the beginning of incredible revival in D.C. One, one man, the most unlikely of characters in the city. But God knew what he was doing. And I don't know who you are today. I can say that literally. I don't know you. But the king of kings, he knows you. He knows where you come from. He knows the good and the bad and the ugly. But he says, if you'll come to me, if you'll come to me, if you'll make the right decision today, I can affect the world through you. It's our time, our moment. In the last days, saith God, I will pour out my one decision. I'm going to bring it to a conclusion because I feel that spirit. I cannot, I mean, if the Holy Ghost told me who you was, I would come back there and get you. I'm not afraid of that. If, if it's the Holy Ghost, I'm like, it's okay. But most often God doesn't do that to me, you know, because you have to be willing to make the decision. I cannot force you. God will not force you. He says, here it is. I offer to you a new life. 
If you'll just bring me your old one, no matter how bad it is, if you'll bring me your old life and lay it at the altar, you have no idea. You might be the preacher Portland's been waiting on. You might be the soul winner that God has ordained as a gift for this church. But it's not even trusting yourself. We get beat up. Well, not me. I can't do it. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm asking you to come and give yourself to Jesus and let Jesus do it. So would you stand with me? You know, the world, this is not the first time the world has gone through dark times. It was in 1500. That's it. You come. The Spirit's calling you. You come. It was 1450. I mean, it's a long time ago, right? 1450. God gave the knowledge to some man and he made a printing press. Before that, you can look in your history books. It's called the Dark Ages. It was very dark. But they made this printing press in. They printed the Bible. And you can look at the history. How a light began to shine. People began to preach the gospel. There was revival in Europe. There was revival in China. There was revival in Asia. There was revival in America. And here we are. I know it looks dark, but I'm telling you. It's never too dark for God. The light shines brightest in a very dark moment. And right now, you may not fathom this, but I read recently in, where was that at? They had 7,000. Bangladesh? 7,000 received the baptism of the Spirit. Oh, listen. Across America today, people are receiving the Spirit. Lives are being changed here in Portland today. That same spirit is moving and he's saying the promise is yours. The promise is yours, sir. The promise is yours, ma'am. He can do the work if you just come. Make the decision. I've seen people struggle with that decision. The Holy Spirit angels are appealing to hearts right now and saying, would you come? Would you just come and make the decision? They're going to begin to sing and worship. And I'm going to come around this altar. And others are going to come and pray. And the invitation is still yours. Don't feel like it, your, your ministry is over. It's only begun. Souls will be saved through your testimony. People will come to Jesus through the presence of God that flows out of your life. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Please like, comment, and subscribe.